And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you. That God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and we do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Just the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now have our second hymn, which is Sing to God. Jesus came and stood among them and said, 
peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. <coughs> Do not doubt but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? <coughs> Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Here is the second lesson. <laughs> Stand now if you are able to join in with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and so the day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. When I say, Lord, as we pray in faith, please respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our church, those in authority, our community, family and friends. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Lord, as we pray in faith, hear our prayer. Help us in those times of doubt or uncertainty when we cannot see you as your physical being. Let us remember your words, feel your presence, and ask for your guidance. Help us remain steadfast and true in our belief at all times. Lord, as we pray in faith, we pray for our church, archbishops, bishops, vicars, and the members of our own church. John, our vicar and rural dean, Judith, our pastoral worker, Steph, our curate, Phil and Julia for their continued support. We pray for our church wardens, John and David, and Audrey, our extraordinary church warden. We pray for everyone here and at home who confess your name and believe in you that we may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in our community. Lord, as we pray in faith, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in authority, in this nation and around the world, as we continue to struggle to understand and minimise the effects of this pandemic. We pray the leaders make wise decisions that protect and support their people through these testing and unprecedented times. We pray for people who are caught in areas of conflict. May they know your love and know they are not alone. May their leaders too hear your voice and strive for peace. We continue to pray for our National Health Service and all key workers 
thanking them for all they have done and sacrificed during the past year to keep our country safe and well. We pray for those who are missed vulnerable, those separated from their loved ones, and those whose livelihoods have been threatened. As we emerge from the months of lockdown, help us work as a whole to bring freedom, safety, and security back to our nation. Lord, as we pray in faith, hear yeah. our prayers. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Bill Downs, <coughs> Glenis Hibbert, Audrey Ferner, and anyone else known to you. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, as we pray in faith, hear our prayers. Hear us as we remember those who have died in faith of Christ. We pray for the family and friends of Norman and Margaret Waller, the Reverend Colin Eastwood, and His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. God of our lives, we give thanks for the life of Prince Philip, for the love he shared among us, and for the devotion to duty. We entrust him now to your love and mercy, through our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Eternal God, we give thanks for the life of Prince Philip, founder of the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Remember his vision and imagination, his interest in young people and his support of them. Inspire us with the same commitment to serve friend, neighbour and stranger alike. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. According to your promises, grant us with them a share in your eternal kingdom. Lord, as we pray in faith, hear our We pray especially for our Queen, Elizabeth, at this sad time. We pray you give her comfort as she mourns her beloved husband, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. We pray for all the royal family as they too great grief. Merciful God, be close to all who mourn especially the Queen and all members of the Royal Family. May they know the hope of your promises and the comfort of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, as we pray in faith, hear our prayers. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise for our justification. Grant to us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve you in the pureness of living and truth, through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now listen to our next hymn, which is, we have a gospel. No, just no. before that, just oh. before that, I'm just going to insert a little blessing for Sorry, yes. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we'll just dance around. <laughs> what a wonderful picture that is. <laughs> 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 you didn't think you were in <laughs> So it's truly wonderful. Fifty years ago, yesterday. And what was the weather like? Sunny. It's sunny, it's sunny like today. That's brilliant. Yeah. And uh, can you give us any, any? Do you want to come out just a little bit? Well, we like to take our mask Yes. <laughs> yes. While you're talking, you can you can look that way. You can tell us what the secret is. I'm putting you on the spot now. The secret is of happy <laughs> God. You go first. Tell me about Otherwise, I'll make you cry. Because the 10th of April, 50 years ago. Was between the 
between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Um, the vicar chose the reading of the road to a mess. And he said, chose the verse, and Jesus himself walked with them. Which means them? Yeah. I think that's the best secret, isn't it? That's the best way. That Jesus walks with us in our married lives. And I just want to say, and she's probably going to cry, or well, she ain't going to be late, so. I, I just, I don't know what the secret is. I, it's love in the end, isn't it? It has to be constant love. Love given and love received. But I just give God thanks every day for the love of a lovely, lovely lady who, back in 1969, when I said to her, on impulse, <laughs> will you marry me? After we've been going out for three weeks or so, we didn't know each other before, and she said yes. And just a teeny bit later in that conversation, I said, are you sure? And she said yes. And uh, she's been just so wonderful, my rock really, and such an amazing support, and had her own Christian ministry in her own right, in all sorts of ways, that I wish I could tell you more about. But Time, you know, I couldn't really. There's so much. But she's been wonderful through thick and thin and through the joys and sorrows that we all get in our married life and through the times when, you know, she probably thought she liked to murder me <laughs> in her sleep. Um, she's been there and she's just absolutely wonderful. And uh, I'm going to give her a kiss, but before I do, um, our one, uh, youngest granddaughter, when um, her mum and dad, this is Michael and Jane, um, when they're looking at things on the TV or on a DVD with the children, because children are quite young, Chloe is four, and uh, whenever something comes on, they think, well, the children should really see this. They'll sort of put hands over their eyes and say, too violent, or something like that. If it's something just not a little bit too violent. So now, whenever they kiss, apparently, Chloe says, too violent, too violent. <laughs> as a church, so if we can just put our hands towards Phil and Julia, and as I say this blessing, we can think of perhaps our own marriages and our own lives together. Um, so, almighty and most merciful God, we bow before you this day in reverence and worship, and we praise you, O oh God, because you established marriage as the most perfect union between a man and his wife. And your word tells us that even before the first uh, star shone in the night sky. You chose Phil and Julia in Christ. You planned their union and you blessed their life together. You have walked with them these past 50 years. And the wonder of your grace and loving kindness takes our breath away and fills us with joy for who is such a God who is faithful to all his promises and his people. And so, Lord, as you have blessed Phil and Julia in every area of their life together, Lord, we lift them down before you and we pray for your continued blessing upon them, upon their marriage and upon their family. Continue to fulfil your glorious purposes in them. Keep them strong in faith and love. Protect them from all adversity. Guide them in your truth and peace and grant them the joy of everlasting life. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
whether or not to believe the other disciples as to whether Jesus had risen from the dead. And I want to, to sort of suggest and go through the passage to say that I don't think it was just about the facts that was really confusing him or hurting him. Uh, so I want you to imagine the scene on that first Easter Sunday when the disciples were gathered together behind locked doors for fear of being discovered. And into their midst we read that Jesus appeared. And the first thing he said to them was, Peace be with you. Then he showed them his hands and his side and he repeated again, Peace be with you. Now his last words on the cross were, it is finished. And now on his resurrection, his first words to them were words, in a sense, as a result of it being finished, the work being finished, which is peace. Peace from God to you. Everything now has been dealt with. All God's anger has been appeased. Uh, forgiveness has been given. Peace between you and God is now yours. And the evidence of this was Jesus' hands and side. He wasn't, in a sense, showing them his wounds as evidence that he was alive or as to his identity. It was just as much to say, this is the ransom that has been paid to grant you peace, to bring you peace. The ransom has been paid. There is no more judgment for you. And in a sense, on that basis, Jesus breathes upon them the Holy Spirit. And he gives them the ministry of forgiveness. Now that's a very strange thing, isn't it? He gives them the power to go out in God's name and say to people, if you repent and turn to God, in God's name I say, you are forgiven. Peace be upon you. Now we often say that when we at the beginning of our services, Peace be with you, and also. And I don't, know, I don't think we realise the power of those words. For we are saying to each other, God has forgiven all your sins. You are now at peace with God. You have been reconciled. And we have the power to do that, the authority. And so you can only imagine their joy and excitement. They have seen the Lord, they have been given God's peace, they have been given an amazing ministry and an anointing by the Holy Spirit. There's just one problem. Thomas wasn't there. He missed it. Imagine how he must have felt the next day when he met them all and they were saying, the Lord has risen. He's done all this. And you can just feel the hurt, I think. I mean, Jesus had met with Mary, first thing. Jesus had met with a couple of disciples on the way to Emmaus. Jesus had met with the rest of the disciples, and no doubt a number of others who happened to be in that upper room at that time. But he'd not met with Thomas. Perhaps it was an oversight. But then Jesus knows everything. Why, why didn't Jesus take time to find Thomas? and meet with him. So everyone is excited, they're all in on the news, but Thomas feels left out. You know, in the passage it says he was a twin, he was always used to doing things with others. You know, all his life experiences were shared with his twin. He was also one of the twelve, one of the inner circle. But not in this case, not in the most important case of all. There was no peace for Thomas. There was no spirit anointing. There was no authority given to him to forgive others. There was no testimony for him to share. I wonder how he must have felt. But if we've ever felt as though we've been left out of something, we're the Billy No Mates, as they call it. Everyone else seems to know, but we weren't told. And that makes us feel as though, well, perhaps I don't really belong to this group. I thought we were all friends. And so you can imagine when Thomas hears their news, we've seen the Lord, he says, well, 
unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in his side, uh, I'm not going to believe it. Not that I can't, I will not. There's no way. I want to have the same experience as you, otherwise I'm not one with you really, I, I, I can't be. Jesus obviously doesn't want me as part of the twelve. It must have been a really difficult week for Thomas and the other disciples. I mean, to their credit, the disciples didn't sideline Thomas, although I suspect his glum face and defiant attitude must have been a bit of a damper in their worship. They're all coming together to praise the Lord and to, to worship and to celebrate that he's alive. And he said, well, I don't think, that. I think you're all crazy. I'm not going to have that. It's a bit of a damper, isn't it? When you get someone coming to the party and, and everything they're doing is dragging me down. But they stuck with it. They didn't drive him away. And he wanted to stay there. And I think that's really important. It's an important lesson for us as a church to recognise what happened in that week. Because it's not our job to convince others of the truth. That's the Lord's job. But it is our, our calling, if you like, to still rejoice in the truth. Um, so when Thomas came, they weren't, I don't, I don't think, sort of trying to, every time he walked through the door, sort of sitting him down and saying, look, let's just go through all the evidence again. Why don't you believe this? Why they weren't giving him the third degree. They weren't trying to force him to admit he was wrong. They weren't piling the evidence on. But they were still continuing to show forth their faith. And Thomas kept coming because I think he saw whatever my issue is, whatever hurt I feel, if I'm going to meet with the Lord, it's going to be in their company. The Lord has met with them. They are the ones who believe. And therefore, if I want to believe, I need to be with them. And I think of this church and think of how many generations of Christians have gathered together here, affirming and rejoicing in the resurrection of Christ. And others have come in. And through the strength of their faith, have opened their hearts to receive the Lord. It's all happened here where people gather together. Not pressurising people to believe, but not denying the wonderful reality that is there anyway. And I'll come back to that a bit later as well. And so it came to pass the following Sunday, when the disciples were gathered together, again behind locked doors, Presumably they were still afraid, despite the peace being given. Um, and this time, Thomas was with them. You see, he hadn't given up wanting to be with them. And once more, Jesus says, peace be with you. Now, it may have been because they were still, still fearful, but I think it was especially for Thomas to let him know that he wasn't left out. And I wonder, have you realised how gracious uh, Jesus is to his requests? You know, here's Thomas and he says, Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out, put your hand into my side. Well, I don't know about you, but um, there are times perhaps when I'll show someone my scars, but I'm not really that keen on them prodding. You know, that's the sort of thing that uh, children do to their grandparents. Have you ever come back? You get, you know, the grandparents had some major operation and they come home and the grandchildren say, can I have a poke? <laughs> where did it, where is it all stand? And, uh, but here's the Lord, you know, he's coming and saying, Thomas, do you want to put your finger in? Have a good, have a good rummage. And uh, stick your hand in my side, just see where the wounds were. Uh, I don't think it's the sort of thing I would go for. But uh, it had, you know, here's the King of Kings suffering that indignity 
for Thomas. And Thomas, he says, I just want you to stop doubting and believe. You can see the other disciples are just watching from a distance. And the Lord is fixed his gaze on Thomas. And he's basically saying, Thomas, I'm here for you. I'm bringing you in. Come home. Stop all this doubting. And he replies, my Lord and my God. Not the Lord, but my Lord. My God. It's that personal encounter which Thomas needed. He didn't really have any more evidence than was already given to him. Yes, he saw it with his eyes, but I think it was more important what he heard with his ears, what he felt in his heart, that brought him to the Lord. And then Jesus went on to say, because I think he understood, he said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In other words, he was talking about us. And he was almost saying, Thomas, you've had this week to think about things. And that was deliberate, not because I was leaving you out, but because I wanted to use you as an example to those who are to come, who won't have the opportunity to see me in person, but who will have the opportunity to believe in me through faith. You know, I think we all have wanted to be there on the first day, uh, to see Jesus stand before our eyes, but that's not our calling. We are to believe because it's our choice. We can choose to doubt or, be or believe. But our happiness in the Lord depends on that choice. Whilst Thomas doubted, he was out of fellowship with his friends. Though they welcomed him into their midst, he was full of sadness. But when he believed, everything changed. And the love of the Lord filled his soul. And so our joy, likewise, is dependent on our belief in his resurrection. The Lord is knocking at the door of our hearts and it's up to us to choose whether to open that door. And I don't think it's a matter of evidence. I was speaking to someone uh, a couple of days ago and she was telling me how she hadn't spoken to her brother for 20 years. And when she eventually got round to doing it, uh, because of circumstances that, in a sense, forced it upon them, they realised it was a misunderstanding. Can you believe that? Something happened, and they each interpreted it differently, and they never got to speak about it, and so they never spoke for 20 years. They felt the other person had a certain view of them. All the time, they could have had precious memories. All the time they could have had joy. And it was all because of potential hurt. And how many of us have said, I refuse to believe. I don't know why, just don't like the evidence. So we use it as an excuse to keep the door locked from Christ. And who is the one that suffers? Believing is not about really asserting to incontrovertible evidence. We don't have to dot the I's and cross the T's. It's about taking that step of faith and saying, Lord, if you're there, come into my life. And then I will know that joy. Because he is waiting, he is knocking, he is wanting to come in. And going back to the church and our role in this, I think of Prince Philip and how when he and uh, Princess Elizabeth first heard that she was to be queen, I can imagine a lot of people around the world saying, she's a bit inexperienced. How, how is 
is she going to cope with being queen? At a time such as this, such, you know, when we're just coming out of the war, there is so much pressure on her. The Commonwealth, look at the state of the Commonwealth, how is this young girl going to be able to cope? And then we have Prince Philip, a distinguished career, recognised, strong leader, saying, I believe in my queen. And I'm going to lay aside everything, all my life, to devote myself to her service. And I can imagine that other people will say, well, if he can do it, and if he's living that out, then I can walk in that authority. I can believe in her because he believes in her. And when we as a church come together, asserting our faith in our risen Lord, that gives others the confidence to say, if they can believe, then why can't I? If they have got all that joy, if they have got that love, then I want that joy. I want that love. And so this Easter, in view of all that's happening, when people are looking for answers, when people are looking for faith, Jesus says, be that confidence for them. Help them to open up their lives. Because I'm knocking. And sometimes we just need someone else to tell us to open the door, don't we? There we are in a corner saying, I'm far too busy, I don't want to go to the door, I don't want to speak to anyone. Someone comes along and says, come on, let's just open the door. And then he will come in. And then they too will say, despite all the hurt, all the pain, my Lord and my God, you are alive. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the ministry of forgiveness. You have anointed us by your Holy Spirit. You have called us to go out into all the world to proclaim that you are risen. Help us to be those people. Not forcing religion down people's throats, but testifying to the love of God. Saying, can't you hear him knocking? Can't you hear him calling your name? He lives. Lord, help us to be like that. Help us to show that same devotion to you as Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, showed to Queen Elizabeth. And Lord, may others see and may others come to know you for themselves. In Jesus' name we pray.
strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Just before we close our service, if you would stand please for the national anthem. Who in the soul?